The following show is brought to you in part by support from Robbins, Kaplan, Miller, and Cerisi. We don't just practice law, we make history. Online at rkmc.com. Welcome. I'm very pleased to introduce you tonight to Anton Troyer, who is my guest, going to talk about leadership and going to talk about the Indian community from which he comes. I read about him first in the Star Tribune uh, because of the latest book he's written, which is called, um, catchy title, Everything You Want to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask. So I'm going to ask, <laughs> without fear, uh, questions about the book but also about your life and your, your um, very interesting career to date. Um, Anton uh, went to Princeton University. He then came back to Minnesota and went to the University of Minnesota where he got his master's and PhD in history here at the U. Um, you had grown up in the Leech Lake area um, on the reservation part of the time and near the reservation. Part right. of the time, correct. And you were just telling me about your family. Tell us a bit about your early days and your mother and your father. Sure. Uh, I guess my upbringing was a little bit different than many people. My mother's native, uh, born and raised on the Leech Lake Reservation. My father's actually an Austrian immigrant and Holocaust survivor. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a pretty interesting mix. We grew up in, you know, my mother's homeland and Part of that experience for me was maybe even a little different than a lot of other native people. We uh, harvested maple sugar uh, every year, hunting, uh, snaring rabbits, uh, things like that, got hauled around to ceremonies. So we had a lot more exposure to things like language and traditional life ways than maybe a lot of people. But at the same time, you know, I had exposure to my father's family. Mm. Um, we were <clears throat> lived in, and uh, you know, attended school off the reservation and then at times on the reservation. Most of my family uh, lives on the reservation. So I kind of had one foot in the wigwam and, and one in the rest of the world and it was, uh, it was certainly interesting. Did that make it hard in terms of your identity and figuring out which, which part of you was kind of the, the dominant part or the part you chose to be dominant? Yeah, you know, I uh, take great pride in all aspects Both. of my heritage, mm -hmm. you know, but there's really no way to explain away the color of your skin <clears throat> or hair or things like that. So everyone else would take one good look at me and they'd think they knew who I was. Sometimes that could be a blessing, but sometimes it could be a real curse. Mm -hmm. Kids especially can be pretty cruel. And uh, mm -hmm. I guess by the time I graduated, in part, like many people, I thought, I want to go any place that has a zip code with a higher population density than the one I came from. <laughs> but in part, I thought, I want to get away from this, you know, the mm -hmm. racial tensions and things mm -hmm. like that. When I applied and got into Princeton, <clears throat> went out of town, I all of a sudden realized that there was no running away from that borderland. It kind of followed me wherever I went. Lots of people imagine Indians and very few understand them very deeply. I bet that was disappointing uh, in one way and kind of informative in another, but you had expected to, to not have that issue following you as much as it did. Oh yeah, I was you know, young and naive. I thought, oh, going to Princeton, you know, most of the high schoolers who were then entering Princeton would have taken all kinds of classes and be really well educated. I thought they'll know something about native right, people. Right. And you know, they just had a sugar-coated version of Christopher Columbus in the first Thanksgiving like everybody else in this country, including the native people, which is another issue. Um, you know, so they didn't really have the capacity. I'd say I learned a lot about myself uh, and people would ask questions and not necessarily 
mean-spirited ones, but they'd say things like, why should Indians have reservations? Mm -hmm. You know, why do they? And I'd have to actually so think about showing that. Showing ignorance in terms of the history. In part, but you know, at the same time, it made me think about it because mm -hmm. I mean, I was raised by a tribal judge and I hadn't really thought about how do you explain tribal sovereignty to someone. Mm -hmm. It's complicated. And it's complicated to explain it to people who live in Minnesota, much sure. more near the, the reservations. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people out east have a lot of misconceptions about the Midwest, mm -hmm. um, not even having to do with ethnic differences. Sure. Um, I lived in Boston for a while too and I was amazed at some of the ignorance about <laughs> what it's like here. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, but I, I read in your book that you said, oh, part of you just wanted to get back home during those years. Sure. But you thought, no, I'm going to stick it out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I had this kind of humorous um, uh, epiphany, you know, that, that I wrote about in the book too, where at one point I got so homesick uh, and so, you know, lonesome for ceremony and things like that. I heard that there was this lady who was running a oh, sweat yeah. lodge ceremony in the New Jersey woods uh, and a Comanche uh, medicine woman. So I went out there to check it out. And when I showed up, there were about 20 completely naked, non-native people waiting to participate mm -hmm. in the ceremony. So part of me wanted to laugh. Mm -hmm. Part of me wanted to get really mad and part of me wanted mm -hmm. to drive away. Mm -hmm. But uh, I opened the car door and was immediately folded into this <laughs> tight embrace by one of these this completely woman. naked strangers. <laughs> and she started um, saying, I'm so sorry for what my people did to your people. And now the desire to either laugh, run away, uh, you know, or get angry is just growing. Mm -hmm. But as I looked at this woman who was an elder, there, she was on the verge of tears, and no matter how misguided her perceptions of Indians might have been, her emotive response was sincere. You felt she was coming from a, a good heart. She had a good mm -hmm. heart even mm -hmm. if she had misconceptions, and it kind of brought me to the realization that, you know, it's pretty normal for non-Native people to feel guilty when looking at the mm -hmm. ugly chapters in our history, and it's pretty normal for Native people to feel angry, mm -hmm. but neither guilt nor anger are really productive emotions. And the, the key would be to provide some meaningful uh, way for people to get past that, you know. And, uh, and so really the, that's kind of the spirit of, of what the book's about is to make it so people don't have to walk around on eggshells so they can ask questions. And through my decades in academia and so forth, I've been accumulating lots of questions and kind of sorted them out around the major themes that, you know, that came up. I didn't um, tell the viewers uh, about your academia. He is a professor at Bemidji State University, um, the author of many books, including the one we mentioned, but also many, many others, many journal articles. I, I noticed that his bio was 43 pages long. And I <laughs> said to you, you must be writing all the time. Um, you say not so, but um, uh, writing a lot. I want to also, before we go any further, just share with the viewers some of your awards and some of the great recognition you've received because um, it speaks to the responsibility, I think, in a way you must feel to be an ambassador. Um, but listen to some of these awards. Um, fellowships from the American Philosophical Society, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Science Foundation, the Minnesota Historical Society, the Minnesota Humanities Commission, the uh, Experience Faculty Development Program, the MacArthur Foundation, that's a huge one, the Bush Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, just wonderful support and encouragement, I'm sure, via all these honors and awards. Um, yeah, but does it, does it make you feel like, oh, this is a, a big responsibility to be an ambassador, to be a spokesman? I, I do feel a sense of responsibility. Uh, you know, it's really not the case for a, a white person, for example, to have to be the barometer right. upon which their entire race is judged. Right. To or all the always, Norwegians. Yeah, or know? whatever group mm -hmm. one happens to represent. Mm -hmm. I think there's a pretty deep understanding that, you know, 
white people, for example, will not all think the same thing about abortion mm -hmm. or any issue that's out there, but it's pretty common for people to say, what's the Indian view right. on whatever? Right. And so one of the big disclaimers that you have to put in there is, there is a diversity of opinion mm -hmm. and experience. I represent one human being's viewpoint, not everybody's. Uh, and you know, you can use that as a window, you know, into the native experience. But you know, so many things impact identity and perspective, and it's it's important to have your head wrapped around that. And it can be really confusing uh, with so, on so many levels. Just give you one little example. The Red Lake Reservation in northwestern Minnesota has one community called Panema, which is a really traditional community. So there's never been a church there. Mm -hmm. There's never been a mission there. No one's ever been baptized. They have 100% traditional religious belief and funerary practice. Their fluency rate is the highest among Ojibwe communities in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. And on the same reservation, on the other side of the lake, is the village of Red Lake, which is predominantly Catholic. I've had nuns there for 90 years in a row. Uh, and these are two villages on the same reservation. Mm -hmm. So they're all citizens the of the Red Lake though. Nation. Mm -hmm. Tremendous differences. Yeah, you may, that's an excellent point. What do you think as you go around and talk about the differences and talk about um, the, the culture, what do you think is the biggest misconception that most people here in Minnesota or the Midwest have um, about Indians in general? Well, there's so many, you know, it really kind of depends on what theme you're, you're focusing on. What's there, the one that bothers you the most? Well, you know, we live pretty close to one another, but it might as well be a thousand miles away sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's really important to build those bridges and, and dispel those misconceptions. For example, lots of people think Indians are all rich from casinos. And at the same time, lots of people think Indians are all living in squalor on reservations. Mm -hmm. It's not possible for both to be 100% true. Right. And the truth, of course, is that it's kind of complicated mm -hmm. that, you know, casinos have had a huge impact on a rather small percentage of the native population. Uh, so it has eliminated poverty for enrolled citizens uh, of the Seminole Reservation in Florida or for uh, a couple of the Dakota communities in southern Minnesota with a couple hundred people. But it's also true that you know, many of the other places in Minnesota and throughout the country are extremely poor. And you pointed out such interesting things in, in the book about casinos and the, some of the negative impact too, where money is being distributed to large groups but then maybe not put back into social services or health care because of mm -hmm. pressures. It's, you know, native governments are political just like the U.S. government mm -hmm. is political. And so, you know, you have a diversity of perspectives and opinions and they're not all perfectly represented in, a, in an action. But I'll give you a couple examples, there's so much difference. Mille Lacs, for example, has a couple of pretty large casinos that are relatively close to Duluth and the Twin Cities mm -hmm. and a relatively small population. But they have been quite wise with how they have used their money. I read that. In yeah, so they've got, you know, <laughs> ceremonial dance halls in each of their communities. They have spent money on new schools, a clinic, Health hired insurance. medicine men, paid them the same wage as a medical doctor. People can choose traditional mm -hmm. or modern medical remedies. Um, or both. All band member, Can they have both. both? Mm -hmm. Yep. All band member retirement fund, all band member health insurance, and they've saved half their money. They're, so, they're endowed with a model. Eclipse. What a model. Yeah. Uh -huh. It is. And, but it's different in different places. There's White Earth with you know, 22,000 members and one casino, and there's no way that they could possibly do something like per capita distributions mm -hmm. to all of their tribal members, you know, of what, $3 a year or something. It, it's just not uh, feasible. Uh, and then you have communities that, like uh, uh, some of the Dakota communities that have done quite large per capita payments to individuals. And I really conflicted views about that. For myself, you know, I kind of lay out here are the arguments for and against, and for is the casino is not the government's casino, it's the people's casino, 
and why shouldn't mm. they be the ones to benefit from it? And there's, there's a logic in that line of, of reasoning. On the other hand, and this is kind of where I end up weighing in myself, is if you just pay people just for being, you take away all the incentives for you know, personal betterment, for the pursuit of education, developing skill sets that can be used to help serve their people, I'd say, you know, take care of your elders, of course, mm -hmm. you know, eliminate the major issues of poverty and housing and so forth, but uh, incentivize education and, uh, and personal am ambitions. So pros and cons, aren't there? As there with, are. with any issue. Um, what fact makes you saddest, and now I'm talking fact rather than myth, about uh, the people that are the Indian part of your family heritage, since mm -hmm. we're talking about your work in this field, um, what makes you most disappointed or, or frustrated, sad? You know, one of the biggest challenges that we have, uh, and the one that you know I've really devoted a lot of my life to, it's uh, it's not the things that people are most aware of, substance abuse, poverty, things like that. That's huge, mm -hmm. but to me, it's the language, culture, and identity piece. Mm. Uh, we are profoundly challenged. And most Americans, you know, have, through their immigrant experience, become completely disconnected from mother land, mother language. Mm -hmm. And aside from a little, you know, pang, like I wish I knew a little more about that, um, you know, there's, the connection is, disconnection is so right. complete that it's right. not even realized. <laughs> Maybe grandma and grandpa speak some of the language yet, but the two generations down right. do not. Well, you know, a third of Minnesota are people of German heritage, and most are five generations or so. They have not lived in Germany and don't speak German. Right. So there's a difference between having German heritage and being a Deutschlander. Mm -hmm. So too is there a difference between having native heritage and being what our ancestors were. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, we get the right to change over time. You know, we don't have to all look like we stepped off the set from Dances with Wolves, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and I, I've had people think just exactly that. Like mm -hmm. this one guy when I was talking mm -hmm. in France says, Monsieur, where are the real Indians? Mm -hmm. And I said, where are the real Indians? Mm -hmm. Where are the real Frenchmen? Because there's a castle across the street and there's nobody living in it. Mm -hmm. I don't see people riding up and down the street on horses and shining armor. I don't even see the berets and little pipes. Where are the real Frenchmen? Uh -huh. So he's thinking. Good and then, response. And then he realizes, okay, it's not the stereotype, uh -huh. but it's something carried on the inside in, la in language, mm -hmm. in culture, connection to place. And it's like that for us too. But we're being really challenged with um, the preservation and revitalization of our language, culture, and to me those are cornerstones of identity and sovereignty. Do you feel like you're losing your language in a way that is hurting then the identity of most people? I think the potential is there. And here's, you know, we're in better shape than a lot of tribes. We really are. So I would say this, the future vitality of- You're talking Ojibwe. Yeah, the future mm -hmm. vitality of the Ojibwe language is not certain, but it is possible. And it all depends on the depth and breadth of our intervention to do that. And, uh, you know, I know our time's limited in a program like this to get really deep, but um, just to give you one example of one of the positive benefits to the preservation and revitalization of a language that might be off of most people's radar screen. Most people are aware that there's an achievement gap, that native kids mm -hmm. are not doing as well in school, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether that's high school college, you know, or beyond. Aren't they in the lowest group right now in Minnesota? From right, there was read? a new, new yeah, uh, statistics came yeah. out that, that showed that, and so everyone's like, you know, scratching their heads about it. But I'll share it, you know, instead of all the stuff that's not working, one thing mm -hmm. that is. In Hayward, Wisconsin, there's an Ojibwe language uh, immersion school. It's mm -hmm. actually a charter school. So mm -hmm. they said, we will teach everything in the Wisconsin DPI standards. We're just going to do it in Ojibwe. And so they did. And about 50% of the native population across the country fails state mandated tests in English. That's across the country. And it was the mm -hmm. same for the native population in the Hayward schools. It was actually the same uh, for the native population at the tribally run school at Le Couture, 
uh, most of the time. Which is right in the Hayward area. Which is area. right in that area. Right. But at the Ojibwe Language Immersion School, they have, for 13 years in a row, had a 100% pass rate in state-mandated mm. tests in English, mm. administered in English. So if somebody's finding something that works, right. maybe we should all pay attention to that. Right. And I think the reasons it work are these, and it's really kind of simple uh, in the sense that, you know, going to school and learning all about the great heroes of the world, not yours. All about the important scientific discoveries mm -hmm. of the world, not yours. Mm -hmm. Somebody else's. All of that mm -hmm. does engineer a really powerful blow to mm -hmm. self-esteem. Mm -hmm. But learning about yourself, as well as the rest of the world, that builds self-confidence, self-esteem, and that translates mm -hmm. into success at everything across the curriculum. So your supposition then is, Anton, that higher self-esteem means more academic achievement. Right. It means less dropping out of school, obviously. Right. It means going on further. Right. Um, it means less poverty, therefore, mm -hmm. less uh, problem with the law. Mm -hmm. So you're saying this is really a, a basis for right. a lot of good things. Yeah, I think a lot of times when you start talking about a tribal language, people think, oh, another pretty bird singing in the forest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a shame that we don't have that one. Mm -hmm. But they don't realize that it might be one of the most powerful tools we have to successfully revitalize the basic health, economic capability, and political leadership of our people. You are, you know, strongly advocating this. Are you doing it sort of in a majority kind of way with other leaders in the community, or are you pushing in a more single-handed way? How does, it, how does it work out across the board with other leaders? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say that the awareness of and advocacy for this is growing in Indian country. Uh, so we do have immersion schools popping up. We do have tribal leaders advocating for and funding some of these initiatives. So it's growing. But a lot of our own people also need a chance to come to the realization of its importance and put the money where it needs to be mm -hmm. and put their best efforts where they need to be. And, you know, when somebody's finding solutions, you know, it, it perks everybody's attention. And so, uh, you know, I do see traction and growth. Um, but, you know, the, the time is right now to get on this, and uh, we can't afford to wait any longer. Of course, there are all kinds of complications, but I, I'm very hopeful about what we can do. One of the intriguing things you said in the book about language that jumped out at me was how via language values are reflected. Right. And some of the differences in values in our different cultures. Mm -hmm. And you use the example of the elder mm -hmm. and how, you know, in, in the Indian culture, the elder is really revered and mm -hmm. honored. Um, probably across the board here in Minnesota, that is not the case right. with most other groups. Um, although there's, you know, effort, of course, but so language and, and values are really intersecting, aren't they? I think so. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I just on that example you mentioned, you know, our word, our base word for elder, gichiaya'a, it literally means great being. Mm -hmm. Our word for an elder woman, mindemuye, means one who holds things together and describes the role of the family matriarch. Mm -hmm. But in English, you got old woman, elderly woman, right. aged woman. And Bad no lady. <laughs> yeah, and no wonder everybody wants to dye their hair, right. get a facelift right. and a Botox injection, mm -hmm. won't admit how old they really are. Goes to you the know. gym every day or whatever. Uh -huh. Yeah, but you know, it, there's a way that language embodies a worldview, and there's a way that you know, a language impacts a worldview. So when you're operating in Ojibwe, you don't have to say something like, respect your elders. Mm. It's built right mm -hmm. in with the any word. The word means use. respect. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a whole nother show, isn't it? But yeah. It's a very interesting point. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, what do you think are the key things that are needed to be a leader representing a larger group standing, you know, to, to help bring understanding? Um, what do you think are the key things that you rely on, that you would like more of, that you, you feel grateful about in terms of your leadership? You know, I really believe in the servant leader 
model mm -hmm. that the green leaf. You know, a leader should really not look at himself as, uh, you know, somebody who's standing above or out in front of everyone else, but someone who is pulling together and marshalling, you know, the best people uh, around him. I've had several leaders use that um, same, you know, concept and, and feel so good about the servant leadership concept, and it's a wonderful concept. I want to give the website that um, you can access if you want to learn more about uh, Dr. Troyer's work, more about his books. I'll let you peek at a couple in a minute here, but you can go to faculty.bemidjistate.edu slash a Troyer, T-R-E-U-E-R. And um, do do that. It's a, a great website and, and you can learn more about what you're all, all um, up to here with lots of, lots of projects. Um, let me show you just a couple of his books. The one we've been talking about, everything you wanted to know about Indians but were afraid to ask, Minnesota Historical Society Press. Um, and as you said to me, just a fun book. Well, fun isn't the right word, but interesting book. And you can read it in bits and pieces and starts and <laughs> stops, mm -hmm. and, but very, very informative. So that's, that's one wonderful book. Um, another one is um, full of great photos. I was so appreciative of the photos. The People of Minnesota series, and it's called Ojibwe in Minnesota. And I'll let you just peek at that. And then, as I said, you've been so prolific. Um, another book about Hole in the Day, who is a great leader, and it's called The Assassination of Hole in the Day. And this book is full of um, important Minnesota history that's not so positive uh, in many, many ways, but that we need to learn more about. So they're all interesting. And these are just some of your books. Thank you so much for coming down Thank and you. Um, sharing with me and with, with the viewers some wonderfully interesting thoughts about leadership in your life. So Thank best you. of luck. Yeah, thank you. We'll be back next week. Until then, have a good week.